Mr. Chancellor, for almost 50 years, Sandra Joie has played an integral role in Canada's literary history. A fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, today she is Professor Emerita and the J.S. Woodsworth Resident Scholar in the Humanities at Simon Fraser University. A writer, critic, and cultural biographer, Sandra Joie is one of the pioneers of the field of Canadian modern poetry. She also has played a central role in the movement in the 1970s that established the study of Canadian literature as an independent discipline. In 1973, she co-founded the Association for Canadian and Quebec Literature, an intellectual society that focuses on questions of textuality and cultural production and the reciprocal exchange of cultural texts across borders of language and of history. Professor Joie's co-edited editions of E.J. Pratt's complete and selected poems helped to establish a badly needed literary editorial tradition for Canada's modern writers. Her seminal biography of F.R. Scott, The Politics of the Imagination, cast light on the many contending lives Scott lived, while also conveying a sense of his unified personality. The foundations of the foundation of principles for Canadian literary biography that she laid down have constituted an essential line of development within the evolution of the broader field of Canadian literature, a field that we would not recognize today without her dedication and contributions to it. Her early writings, including her groundbreaking work on the cultural analogies between the Canadian modernist poets of the 1920s and the landscapes of the group of seven painters in the years after the Great War, continue to remain required reading in university courses. Her 2013 Governor General's Award for Nonfiction and the 2014 Canada Prize for the Humanities for Journey with No Maps, A Life of P.K. Page, is only the most recent evidence of Professor Joie's ongoing production of groundbreaking, field-defining scholarly work. Mr. Chancellor, I present to you, Sandra Joie, that you may confer upon her the degree of Doctor of Letters, Honoris Causa. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my pleasure to invite Dr. Joie to deliver the convocation address. Dr. Joie. Chancellor Mean, Principal and Vice Chancellor Fortier, Dean Medwell, proud parents and guests, and most of all, fellow members of the graduating class. I hesitated a moment when graduates were invited to stand, but I thought perhaps I won't be a graduate until the service is over. <laughs> In any event, this is a wonderful occasion for us all. For you graduates who have worked so hard to get to this point, for your happy parents and professors, and for me personally. Nonetheless, I must confess, I have an odd little feeling to be receiving a McGill degree some 60 years after I first started at university. But then, on second thought, I'm a Newfoundlander. And as we know from CBC Radio, those old timers of us know, that everything happens, quote, a half hour later in Newfoundland. <laughs> Each new generation of graduates faces new challenges. For F.R. Scott, later McGill's Dean of Law, and Prime Minister Trudeau's mentor, the issues were social justice and the bringing home of the Canadian Constitution. My generation believed passionately in developing a Canadian literature and implicitly a Canadian national identity. A belief validated a few years ago when Alice Munro won the Nobel Prize for Literature. A wonderful surprise. 
<laughs> but I suspect that today's graduates in arts and religion will face new issues of quite a different order. My first English class was at Memorial University in Newfoundland in September 1956. We studied Shakespeare's The Tempest, incidentally with a graduate of McGill. And I came to class fully equipped with a pencil and a notebook. Not very high tech, you think. Quite true. And as I began to think about today, I realized what a technological abyss lies between your world and mine, changing the ways we live and think, and eroding many of the secure jobs that formerly awaited graduating university students. It was then that I had a eureka moment, and I realized that you are all at the start of a new industrial revolution. The German economist Klaus Schwab believes we are living in what he calls the fourth industrial revolution that will fundamentally alter our lives beyond anything we have experienced before. This is because the present fusion of technologies has eliminated distinctions between the digital, the physical, and the biological. What you have experienced thus far has been largely a communications revolution. Schwab speaks of, and I quote, the possibilities of billions of people connected by mobile devices with unprecedented processing power and access to knowledge. These possibilities, he says, will be multiplied by emerging technology breakthroughs in fields such as artificial intelligence, robotics, the Internet of Things, nanotechnology, biotechnology, quantum computing. The list is endless. But I will stop with his perception that some of these new technologies may threaten our already fragile social equality by dividing society into opposing groups of high skill, high pay, versus low-skill, low-pay jobs. Or even worse, no jobs at all. When you couple these problems with global political unrest and the devastating effects of climate change, they will, as Naomi Klein has argued, change everything in many as yet unforeseen ways. So how do you navigate the dynamics of this new world? I will speak only of how we communicate and make perhaps an audacious suggestion. By necessity, most of us have learned to substitute texting for direct speech, even if the person we're speaking to is just down the corridor or even in the same room. But rather than fostering the one-to-one -one intimacy of a global village, as Marshall McLuhan once thought, texts or short phone messages can become a back-and-forth relay of snippets of fact that do not persuade, as does direct speech. Humans have evolved to depend upon facial signals to decipher meaning. Smiley faces or emojis are meant to direct us in the same way, but they rarely succeed as speech directly given does. Psychiatrists tell us that children must have human eye contact if they are to develop those parts of their brain that foster attachment, especially love and sympathy. Furthermore, neuroscientists argue that those parts of the brain that allow adults to process another person's feelings are similarly activated by eye contact. Sherry Turkle, in a book called Reclaiming Conversation, The Power of Talk in a Digital Age, concludes, we pay a price for living our lives at a remote. That is because members of this generation 
do not get sufficient practice in arguing directly about their own needs as past generations have had to do. Worst, during the last 20 years, as a recent American study has shown, there has been a documented substantial drop in empathy among college students. This is a complex pro problem, and no one really knows how it will all turn out. But the paradox is that when we are connected to the digital media, we are disconnected from other people. And at the same time, because of the magical intimacy of computer technology, our love affair between ourselves and our digital devices we imagine we are speaking to the world when sometimes we are talking only to ourselves. In 1969, I was one of the <clears throat> early computer persons in the sense that there were less than 40 people in North America using the computer for literary purposes. So I know that technology has been and must be a continuing part of our world. Nonetheless, there is a flip side to convenience, the large negative human space around texting and brief sound bites. These ways of communicating preclude the developing of the close and deeply emotional relationships that can only emerge from one-to-one -one discussion or, if necessary, the kind of heated argument that makes you really and truly understand where the other person is coming from. Reading a great and complex work of literature, especially in the classroom with a community of readers, can sometimes also give you something of this same understanding, as, for example, that wonderful section in the last act of The Tempest, where the magician Prospero, bent on revenge on his enemies, is persuaded through to forgiveness, entirely through dialogue with his good spirit, Ariel. At the end of the play, he states that he is going to break his magic staff and throw away the books. What he says is, I'll break my staff bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than ever did plummet sound, I'll drown my book. Now, I'm not suggesting you throw away your cell phones, but you might consider sometimes leaving it in your back pocket when you next talk to your real as opposed to your virtual friends on a subject of real importance because that's when it really matters. And keep your books, read more of them, remembering that the Canadian variety taught and published here at McGill with such distinction has particular relevance to our own unique circumstances. They too are magical because they feed your imagination or soul, as the Elizabethans like to say. The challenge ahead for you as graduates is to temper this brave new world of technology with more sharing and more person-to-person -person technology. In conclusion, I would like to thank you and to wish you the very best for your future and to thank McGill for inviting me to be part of this happy convocation. Thank you.